Hi, this is your host, Sapil Bharatiya, and welcome to a special edition of TFR Insight, where we're going to talk about this <laughs> big, serious mess with uh, solar wind and uh, the kind of cybersecurity threat that our nation and our organizations are facing today. Uh, to discuss that, we have with us the right person, uh, Ron Nixon. He's a VP at uh, Polyverse. Ron, first of all, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Nice to be here. Uh, thanks for taking time out because I know that you are helping organizations respond to this crisis that we're going through. But there's a lot going on. Just a few hours ago, Microsoft also said that even they got swept in this whole solar wind thing. Uh, so I want you to just kind of unpack. I think at the core here is Orion, which is network monitoring managing tool that solar wind offers. So talk a bit about what exactly is happening here. So this is um, uh, one way of putting it. It really is a, a classic example. It's a book example of a, a multi-leveled, sophisticated cyber attack from a very disciplined, very patient um, attacker, right? So, um, you know, the, the ATP that we're talking about, the persistent threat guy that, guys and gals that we're talking about are, are literally some of the best in the business. And so what they've done is they've, They've taken, so SolarWinds Orion, right? They, they've taken what is normally a trusted application in, in thousands and thousands of networks. Um, and, they've, and they've modified the update to it to allow them to take advantage of it. Um, and so from a cybersecurity standpoint, um, this would be seen as, right? So the, the software in itself is seen as trusted software. It has been vetted a thousand times over from every government organization, uh, multiple healthcare organizations, everybody uses solar winds as part of their infrastructure or lots of people use solar winds as parts of their infrastructure. Um, and that also means that the updates are trusted in the same manner as the software, right? So if I've got an update coming from solar winds, it's going to be seen as a trusted update. And yeah, it's going to go through a screening process to a degree, um, but that screening process is not gonna be all the times as in depth as if it was a new piece of software, right? It's 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 trusted. So they've taken advantage of that. They've used it as a platform to come in, enter the network itself, and then and then use that to execute lateral movement and escalation of privilege just to get access to more and more information. Um, and we've seen some pretty big names on this, right? So FireEye, um, FireEye is one of them. Um, as of this morning, like you were saying, uh, Microsoft is now on there, and there are. 18,000 give or take organizations that have actually downloaded that update. And so those are all vulnerable on some point. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. It's 18,000 organizations of all size. It's not 18,000 know, random users. So uh, imagine how many users are there at every organization. And then we are also talking about governments which are affected here. Yeah. And so, yeah, and you begin to look at that, right? So, um, so across the government, all the government organizations, all the all four services use SolarWinds as part of their management. Um, so and SolarWinds Orion is part of that toolkit that they use. Um, so the Army's got 1.4 give or take million users in their environment. Um, you know the Air Force is somewhere around a million and some change. Um, you get a look at Department of State; there are several hundred thousand. I mean, those are big organizations. Um, and the scary part about it is, uh, on one hand, it's like the people who were not disciplined and didn't update are the ones who aren't vulnerable right now, uh, which is kind of kind of funny. But it's the organizations that normally take the time because it's the 18,000 who've actually updated. Um, so those are the organizations. And you've got Fortune 500, you've got Fortune 10 companies that are on that list as well. And then you've got you've got hospitals and you've got um, critical infrastructure. Everybody uses the software on some level. Or I should say every industry definitely uses the software on some level. How serious is it is, you know, for and let's just keep focus on government sector, not the private sector. Um, so from a serious serious standpoint, um, let me put it into your actual operational terms, right? So in, in operations of, of what the software does, right? So I use SolarWinds Orion as part of my network management and operations space. So that means that every router, switch, networking device in my infrastructure, a lot of my servers, I use it to monitor and maintain them. Um, so I can operate that in one of two ways. I can operate that as a read access or I can use it as a read write access, right? Um, and normally I'm going to be using that platform to do both. And so my user base for SolarWinds is usually an elevated privileges base of at least network administrators, probably network engineers. 
Um, and those same people, depending on the size of the organization, probably have access to your identity and access management controls. Um, if you're using micro segmentation, uh, zero trust infrastructure, right? These people have access to pieces of all of that. So even if I didn't use any other pieces, if my network is engineered properly, SolarWinds is probably inside of my in ma management infrastructure. So whether I'm separating it by VLAN or some other method, it's sitting inside that management architecture. Um, so that also means that if they've breached SolarWinds, um, in some way they have a more immediate access to the management architecture of my environment. So by getting access to management architecture, I mean, what harm can be done? Can they access uh, sensitive data or they can only get access to management tools? I mean, I want to understand the real harm, actual harm that can be there. Uh, from a user standpoint, odds are that your, uh, your identity and access management for your users are in that space, right? So if, so let's take it from a, a, a somewhat, so I'm going to go middle ground. I'm not going to do hyper over security engineered. I'm going to do what most people are probably doing today. Um, so most people today, so I'm probably managing all of my users and all of my endpoints from that infrastructure. So uh, if I'm doing it right, I probably don't have databases that have user information like PII type kind of stuff in there. Um, I probably don't. Um, I'm hoping you don't. Uh, <laughs> but but I'm probably uh, that that information should be isolated somewhere else with different levels of protection. And I want to separate that stuff from my ma management anyway, because if one of because usually, um, especially for criminal actors, that's where they're going. They're going after PII. They're going after account information. They're going after that kind of stuff. But when you start talking about nation state actors or, or criminal actors who are looking to establish a foothold um, or gain control to open up other spots of the network, right? The management place is where I want to be. So although I may not have access to user information, I definitely have access to most of my telemetry information that tells me what my network is doing, where my user concentrations are at, maybe not necessarily usernames. And it will give me ideas on where all of my real critical information, where my key, where my key infrastructure is at, where the, the stuff that I really need to protect, it's going to let me know where it's at. And there's a good chance that it's also the highway to be able to get at those things. I can open those things up from the management network. So that is the, the I mean, we can, we actually don't know what incentives they were looking for, but what are the, so that's what they were looking for. Yeah. If, if I were to guess, yes. And if you go back and if you look at um, Cozy Bear's history, right, they, um, they've got a history of going after high profile um, government information. Um, you go back to the DNC hack, right? Um, you know, it, it's, um, it's usually nation state, national level security type kind of information and data um, that they can pull back to, to for whatever the nation state wants to use it for. I also want to know uh, that whether it's over or we should expect more payloads, we are still in the middle of the whole cycle, number one. And number two is the timing. Our government is going through a transition period because there are a lot of departments. Of course, I do understand that leadership doesn't make any changes you know, at the middle level, but when the lead, there is a change going on at the top level, you know, even the middle, you know, you cannot focus on that. We are looking for you know, a holiday season, COVID-19 is going on, uh, which is already a crisis, and then the government is also going through the transition. Yeah, um, so, so back to the first question. The first point is, is do, you, do, we, do we expect more of this? Um, so yes. Point blank. Um, they're not, they're going to go and they're going to leave behind back doors, right? So like today, the, the organizations that have been targeted, they're, they're, doing, they're doing their operations in two parallels. One, one is to make sure that they, they're doing a hunt operation to make sure they locate them and push them out of the network, right? But the other piece they're also doing in parallel to that is they're looking for those back doors to make sure that they can't come back in. Um, you know, and, and you're going to see some, you're going to see some distraction operations going on. There's a good chance of it where they will leave back doors that are in critical infrastructure that are, that are not easy to find, but, but the hunt teams will find them. But then they're also going to leave those back doors and those off the wall places, like a movie server that hasn't been touched in two years or something like that, that should have been gone off the network. They're going to leave a presence there as well. Um, and, and so, 
and then back to the second part, like the, the impact of everything else that's going on. So it's kind of a perfect storm from a from a geopolitical standpoint. You've got you've got the transition. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, but you've got you've got the transition going on. You've got all of the upheaval around the actual election itself. Um, <clears throat> then you've got the the firing of uh, you know in the in the retirement of key personnel within cyber leadership um, over at CISA. So that all creates this vacuum, not necessarily of uh, of I would say like keyboard level performance or even middle management decision making, but it still impedes the ability for that organization to report outside of itself, right? Because that leadership are the leaders that decided what was valuable to go out and what wasn't. So it impedes some of that. And and it also causes a distraction where your eyes are kind of elsewhere. It's a nice, it's a wonderful distraction tactic or not even, not a distraction tactic they created, but it's just a perfect storm of being able to come in and do this, and people aren't quite paying attention right now. They're looking at all of these other things. Um, and so there's probably, they, they will probably be able to, when it's all said and done, my opinion is that they'll probably be able to equate a degree of their success to everything else that's going on. If we talk about the problem side, let's talk about the solution side. So what are the mitigations? Are they in place? Are they working? But as you also said, you know, we are in the middle of it, you know, it's not over yet. So a lot of the initial stuff is being contained pretty quickly, right? So, <clears throat> which is wonderful, right? So Microsoft came out, um, you know, I think somebody, uh, how did they equate it? Um, uh, I think they said they turned the Death Star on them. Uh, but, but but Microsoft came out with some pretty quick um, interactions, revoking the certificate, or uh, yeah, re revoking the certificates uh, for the patches, and then and then putting some implementations into Defender. So they've done some good things with that. Um, but that being said, those are those stop the landing point, right? That stops the initial exploit. That doesn't do anything for the initial lateral movement that's in, that's going on today, right? And so there, where you start talking about your your controls for your controls for zero trust, your um, your containment operations of how am I locking all of these other pieces of my network down to make sure that they can't move through that environment seamlessly, or or how do I deny them access to other spaces very quickly, right? And so and you can do some of that with um, changing network configurations. Um, you can add additional software protections on some of your things, um, but it's but it is very much. Um, on a case by case, organization by organization, network by network type kind of thing. It, it is not a, there's no silver bullet that will fix this for everybody. Um, and and SolarWinds has already released the patch. So um, so the other piece is, is this forces the bad guys into a, not a panic cycle because they know this is coming, but it forces them into a cycle of, I have to make sure I and place my back doors as quickly as I possibly can so I can come back in later. And I need to exfil everything I can out of these areas where I'm at now because I might not make it back in. And that is what's going on on the bad guy side. And that's nice because it has the potential to create noise so you can find them faster, right? Um, kind of like a, a shark hunting in the water. It goes for the noise first or goes for the blood first. And those hunt teams should be kind of looking kind of like sharks of where's that little Where's that, you know, that molecule of blood to go after to follow the path to the target? So one of the things that we have to take into account is because we're talking about, uh, you know, this exploit is on Microsoft products and on, on a Microsoft platform. So the bad guys know this and they know that Microsoft is going to respond fairly quickly and they know that SolarWinds is going to respond fairly quickly. So they've moved out of that Microsoft environment fairly quickly. They're operating in that open source space. They're operating in those Linux environments um, or messing around in the endpoints where we might not be looking for them, although they might be Windows endpoints, but they're gonna be looking in that space now. Um, so it's important to understand that your, your adversaries, are sophisticated. you're playing a game of chess against grandmasters um, and, um, and you beat them by bringing other grandmasters to the, by bringing more grandmasters than they have to the table. So you can anticipate their moves and they're going to be operating outside of that windows environment because they know that plug is coming to stop them in that windows space. Right. And that also brings us to the point of, you know, we, there's called a street lamp effect because you're looking only where you're looking. So there are so many areas. Yeah. Yeah. You, you get blinders on to like right now, everybody's panicking and everybody's looking at solar winds. And, and on some level, it scares me because I, I completely understand when somebody says, Pull the plug on Solar Winds, Orion. Pull the plug on Solar Winds. I completely understand that thought process, but you're using it. If you're using it to manage your network and you don't have a replacement, you're now blind in your infrastructure. You're blind on your highway. 
So your network is your highway. It's how all of your data moves around. And um, all of your data and information moves on your highway. And you're you're turning off your headlights and you're at night. And then you're going to put a blindfold on just to make it worse. Um, so so in some levels, you know, I, I, I completely understand um, CISs and DHSs, uh, un, you know, putting that out. But at the same time, you have to be pragmatic. And in, in what is your replacement? There are open source replacements. You can download load something for free, but don't pull the plug on your network monitoring before you can have something else in place to monitor your network. How different things would have been if uh, Uri and other solar wind components were open source? Where you know, of course, it's not that just because open source everybody is auditing it, but it does, you know, uh, and code does get audited. Uh, so, so do, would that make any difference? Um, I, so, uh, so the potential is definitely there that somebody would have caught it, right? So. You look at the the code lines of so I'm gonna I'm gonna make that a double edged sword, right? So on on one hand, uh, because it could have been if it was open source, the potential the, it would have been easier for them to inject the exploit into the code. Like they would have just submitted it as part of a build and said, "Hey, look, this is my new code," um, and they could have brought it in from any country in the world. They could have submitted it from a friendly country, um, so they could have done that fairly easily. But the the process for a lot of open source material is pretty rigorous, um, especially when you start thinking about like management type kind of tools. People really dig into that. Um, so the odds that somebody would have flagged it and caught it is is pretty significant, and it's definitely more than just Solar Winds themselves reviewing it, right? So, um, so yeah. So I, I mean, so I think it's a double edged sword. I think it would have been easier to inject, but I think the potential for them to get caught could have been much higher. Yeah, I mean, the next kernel is a good example. It's one of the most widely, every server that you talk is literally running on <laughs> Linux, even Azure runs a lot. So yes, it, you know, any dev maintainer will catch it. Uh, so uh, I do not know once again whether this is relevant in this context or not, but what Polyverse does is, you know, you try to stop attacks before it happens because, because of the polymorphing you do. So do you think that polymorphing model or polyscripting model would ha would work in cases like these also where you really do not have, because what happens is, uh, as we have discussed earlier, that uh, with the attackers, they want it to be easy so they can replicate it to so many machines. But if every machine is kind of unique, it, it won't work. So will that work in this model case? A technology like Polyverse would have been uh, very beneficial uh, in this case. And, and the reason being is so we, so to be honest, we wouldn't have stopped the initial payload coming in, right? So that initial exploit, that initial update, trusted software, trusted update, we wouldn't have stopped that. But what would have been stopped is okay, once they've gotten their foothold, the applications, the exploits that they downloaded into the environment to either begin exfiltration of data or to begin lateral movement or escalation of privileges, those pieces of software wouldn't have been able to hook into the operating system and they would have failed. So wouldn't have stopped the initial entry, but definitely would have impeded uh, lateral movement and exfiltration by any additional executables they would have brought to the table. Yeah, I'll just quickly wear my fiction writer's hat. And uh, uh, as everybody is focused on solar wind, maybe some other attack is also being planned because this could also be a big distraction also because as you said, everybody just talking solar wind windows. So we uh, so the, the big point is that, you know, no, don't put the blinds on your eyes. Don't have follow the street lamp effect and look there. Uh, keep a very holistic, very open approach. Uh, Ron, thank you so much for, first of all, simplifying this topic because this is really complicated. So much is happening. It's hard to capture all of it. So first of all, thanks for capturing that. And second, thanks for taking time from your busy schedule because you are helping our organization respond to that and explain these things. And I look forward to talk to you again. Thank you. Oh, no problem, man. Take care.